country which was invaded. Another important reason was trade on fathers. So trade and fathers also uh, let people put to be in, in contact with each, with each other for centuries or centuries ago. Now with the technological advancement, the internet also plays an important role, especially within youngsters who uh, meet uh, from different countries around the world and they exchange and chat and thus uh, the result is that contact. So for these reasons we have a set of outcomes. So the outcomes that uh, are very noticeable is uh, borrowing. The first uh, uh, outcome of language contact is borrowing since it is the easiest one. When two languages are in contact, automatically people from both sides are going to take or borrow words from the other languages. Uh, another important uh, outcome is code switching which is widely known. All, uh, all around the world, uh, people switch between languages, especially, especially now, as I said, with the, uh, the internet and the technological advancement. Other uh, outcomes or uh, results are uh, code mixing, bilingualism, diplosia, uh, pigeons, or the creation of pigeons and uh, Creole languages. And we put here. Uh, or a mixed language between uh, two different languages. The difference between a pidgin and a creole is that a creole is uh, a pidgin language with native speakers, i.e. the second generation of pidgins is called uh, creole. Now, we move to uh, the definition of uh, hybridity. So before going to linguistic, what is linguistic hybridity, we shall go or explain what is meant by the word hybrid in itself. So the word the hybrid in itself comes from the Latin hybrida. It originates in biology that refers to the offspring of two animals or plants of different breeds, or varieties, or species, or genera, especially as produced through human manipulation for specific genetic characteristics. Yet the term was employed in linguistics involving all words composed of elements originally drawn from different languages. And this is what is meant by uh, linguistic hybridity, i.e. Uh, words or language which is mixed with different languages. The term linguistic hybridity uh, insertion in linguistics was during the 19th century, uh, indicating all cases where languages have been mixed. Now, uh, the research methodology, the data uh, collection uh, procedure, the purpose provided for this study has been collected by recording spontaneous conversations. I mean, uh, we didn't tell our informants that they are being uh, recorded. Or otherwise, they would have uh, modified their language in order to satisfy uh, the, uh, the researcher. And this is what is called the observer's pattern. So we avoided telling them that they are being uh, recorded. So as you have reliable and valid data, we carried out four recordings of the speech of a number of Algerians without their prior knowledge. Some of the respondents of this research are Algerian speakers from all categories of the society with different uh, levels of education, age, and social backgrounds. Uh, we recorded the uh, spontaneous speeches so as to get natural instances of hybrid uses of language. Now, directly, in order not to take a, a long time from you, the data analysis. So, here are some examples, because I'm going to mention examples, uh, starting with code switching, uh, instances that are very noticeable in the Algerian speech or the speech of the Algerians. And uh, it takes many forms. For example, uh, we have sw switching between the main clause and subordinate clause uh, uh, and the embedded interrogative sentence. For example, uh, the first example, Rana, the Spanish interview. Here's the full fact. We are 15 million people. What will we do? So our data also reveal cases of switching in clauses on purpose. Uh, for example, if on the recensement, where she should go, the end, the end of the world, we leave that. Uh, they do the census in order to see how many words uh, and does. Another example, you need to see love for nourrir les gens. You need to stay love for nourrir les gens. You have to explain.
expand the land to nourish the people. Uh, uh, other examples, uh, idiomatic expressions, for example, and continue to show that. Okay, it is said that she continued the way. Vous avez, vous les Arabes, vous avez des, euh, des ressources. It is said that you, the Arabs, have resources. Uh, uh, I have other examples such as uh, quotations. For example, someone who says, Qui va gagner la vie Allez, c'est où il y a des nayales Où il y a des nayales Ok, as God said, are those who know the same as those who demand them. Correct. Now, good mixing. So for good mixing, we have also uh, a set of examples such as and that is the word that we in a jamais existing. You are the biggest thief who has never existed. Another example like Iji Gul Kili Doctor. He comes to tell you that he is a doctor. Uh, for following, I have uh, chosen a list of all words from different languages. These words that I'm going to mention now are all part of the daily life of Algerians. And me, myself, I use a, 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 a huge number from those uh, words that I have been mentioned now. For example, we have four words. I have selected uh, only a few or five or six words from each language. Here, for example, I have words from Berber, like Siku, which is uh, in French is Asperge, in English uh, Asparagus, uh, Fokoron, a Tortue. Tortoise, a lactose, for example, and book, a goat, a uh, in French, a snake, a kejoba, a gorge, throat. These are all words from Berber. I have a list of words from Turkish, like tosse, uh, une assiette, a plate, kofkurej, une bouloir, a kettle. Machine, euh, des chaussettes, sens, bichler, euh, une bulle, une, so une sandale, sendo, périlic, which is public, public. Euh, also, I have uh, a list here of words borrowed from, uh, from Spanish, sorry, ronda, which is the uh, jeta, name of parts, tribina, uh, which means uh, three parts uh, of the same value. Uh, Pantoufle, leather slippers, a gospel, desire or désir, nombre, numéro, number. From French, which is a uh, uh, language that has a uh, big influence on uh, Latin Arabic. For example, we say bus, bis, bus, l'armée, l'armée, uh, casquetat, plural of casket, cas, pangla. Uh, Bola, which is Bala, Bola. These are uh, nouns. Uh, also, I have here yeah, uh, a list of verbs. Uh, for example, keep sonne, when it rains, visitina, nous avons visité, we have visited. Uh, il visuna, pour nous réviser, pour nous sonne, réviser pour nous, pour nous, pour réserver des routes pour nous.
in which communal daily life and traditional cultural practices are lived without articles. Singh's exaltation of the stock simplicity of the communal life of the islands, as well as their depleted landscapes, aims to embody the singularity of the national character as something romantic and pre modern. In Singh's ethnographic idealization of the airlines, for instance, there is clearly a project of mythologizing this community and history as a locus among us. Ireland is seen as a spiritual land. Such an ideal and idealizing image of Ireland is quite understandable if seen within its historical and political context. Edward Said sees this kind of romanticization of national identity and culture as an essential step towards national liberation. He interprets this cultural nationalism as a necessary phase in the anti-colonialism struggle. This phase for him precedes independence. Singh's historicization of Irish culture, community, and geography indeed rests on this mythopoetic vision. For instance, his geography is far from being essentially pristine, and his air islands, or air communities rather, are by no means ethnically pure. Myth is the driving force behind this local history and community. This mythopoetic history, a cult, historical trauma and violence, for sure, colonization and the great hunger of 1845 represent great traumatic events for Ireland. For saying the national character is articulated in the cultural and linguistic specificities of the Arab communities. The language of the community represents something of a lost ditch resistance to colonial linguistic invasion and hegemony. In his account of the islands, the locals not only preserve something of a pure national character, but also perpetuate the national language that is Gaelic. It is uh, shown in this passage, of course. I quote, I found that here, at least, English were imperfectly understood. When I asked them, a boy and a man, he met on the island, if there were any trees in the island. They held a hard consultation in Gaelic. And then the men asked if tree meant the same thing as bush, and of quote. Singh's celebration of Irish primordiality is expressed through his, his specialization of the island's objects. In the following passage, he enumerates local artifacts which attest not only to be to the local character of the Arab Islands, but also to a historical period that has been lost in Eastern Ireland. I quote, each article on these islands has an almost personal character, which gives the simple life where all art is unknown, something of an artistic beauty of medieval life. The curious and spiral leaves, the tiny wooden barrels, the homemade cradles, churns and baskets are full of individuality and being made from materials that are common here, yet to some extent peculiar to the island. They see as a natural link between the people and the world that is about them. If Singh chooses the airlines for his revivalist project, Yates focuses on Galway and Slido as his locus classicus of Irish cultural and communal idealism. Yates's cultivation of Irish cultural singularity and character is mostly concerned with the celebration of national folklore and myth. For him, the relationship between mythology and nationality is so solid and dialectical that it is not possible to define a nation without its mythological and legendary heritage. He wonders rhetorically, I quote, have not all races had their first unity from a mythology that marries them to rock and hill, end of quote. The idea of a spiritualized island is at the heart of Yeats' poetic and political project of Irish revivalism. For him, only a mind in harmony with its mythic and mystical heritage can resist policies, colonial policies, sorry, of cultural assimilation and obliterations. For Yeats, myth articulates national character and genius. Nations are built on founding myths. He uses the connection between national mythology and national identity from the human perspective of the collective unconscious. So he translates Jung's concept into a triad of unities, unity of being, unity of culture, and unity of limits. Unity of being is concerned with the nation's mystical and spiritual organisms, while unity of culture refers to the cultural heritage shared by the community members. The three concepts of unity are not separable from each other. 
For yet, a people without the coalescence of these unities cannot amount to a nation. National unity rests upon the ensemble of myths and legends accumulated and preserved in the great memory of the nation. The national reservoir of images articulates itself in symbols and emblems. I quote, was not a nation as distinguished from a crowd of chance comers, bound together by this interchange among the streams of shadows, the unity of image which I saw in national literature being but an originated symbol, end of quote. Here, he makes the difference between a nation and a crowd of chance comers. If the former signifies unity around one single destiny, the latter implies diversity and lack of unity. It is important to note here that it occults the fact that nations are essentially made of migratory flux and crowd of chance comers. In other words, he denies national ethnic hybridity. Ireland itself had been crisscrossed by immigration and emigration. It is fallacious to think that nations are pure entities and ahistorical identities. Nations are, as Renan reminds us, built and unbuilt, made and unmade throughout history. I quote, The nation, like the individual, is the culmination of a long past of endeavors, sacrifice and devotion, of all cults that, all, that of the ancestors is the most legitimate, for the ancestors have made us what we are. A heroic past, great men, glory men, glory, this is the social capital upon which one bases a national idea. End of quote. Nations are, after all, historically constructed. In the above mentioned quote, Yeats seems to ignore this fact about nation building and for political reasons. He, in other words, a historicizes the Irish nation in tune with his philosophy of imaginative nationalism. Nations are conceived in what we call mythic time. This time is, of course, different from historical time. The writing of nationalism requires the celebration of what is most distinctive about the nation. Yeats, like Singh, subscribes to this view of the statism. For him, national liberation has to inexorably go through the cultivation of a distinct Irish identity that stands in stark opposition to the English one. In the following passage, Yeats calls upon the young Irish artist to translate national geographic, mythological, and cultural reality into an aesthetic and political program to serve Ireland's cause of liberation. I quote, the Greeks, the only perfect artists of the world, looked within their borders, and we, like them, have a history fuller than any in modern history of imaginative events and legends which surpass, as I think, all legends, but days in wide beauty. And in our land, as in theirs, there is no river or mountain that is not associated in the memory with some event or legend. I would have Ireland recreate the ancient arts, the arts as they were understood in Judea, in India, in Scandinavia, in Greece and Rome, in every ancient land, as they were understood where they moved the whole people." End of quote. He highlights on the schools the importance of national borders for the latter of arcade what is inside from what is outside, I mean, the national from the external. What he seeks to achieve for Ireland is a cultural and national renaissance that can put Ireland on a par with great nations and cultures such as India, Greece, and Rome. Interestingly enough, the insistence on the quasi nature and purity of the Western communities and culture creates something of a schizophrenia perception of the Irish identity in the Celtic Revivalist project. That Western Ireland is associated with culture and communal purity is archetypal in this tradition. Yet, what gives ground to concern is that is the geographical splitting of Ireland into two identities. In the Celtic tradition, the Western region is synonymous with cultural and identical authenticity, while the Eastern part is seen as a hybrid form of Irish identity. Hybrid in the sense that, it's, that it has been mixed with the British character and political economy. That identitarian hybridity is almost an inexorable result of colonial encounters is not accepted by the head of political and aesthetic project, is a short-sighted vision of the issue. Homi Baba argues that such hybridity is a natural outcome 
of colonial encounters. Yet, what the Celtic revivalists seek to overvalue in their literature is not this hybridity, but rather the forms of cultural and racial and communal purity they think they still exist in enclaves scattered along the western coastline of Ireland. Canoes and factories seem to coexist on the Iron Islands. Ironically, civilization, or at least traces of it, are not very far from Singh's bucolic explorations of the local culture and geography. Despite Singh's overdetermined romanticization of the islands, details and micro narratives somewhat be like his grand narrative of the local culture, community, and geography. No story better confirms this ironical situation than the one Singh himself narrates. In his peregrinations on the islands, Singh tells us the story how he hits upon a golf ball. The discovery puzzles the author. This is a physical trace of tourism industry that his narrative seems to mystify or deny. One morning, he sees birds dropping shellfish on the rock to break them. However, there is one bird that continually drops a white object. When Singh drives the, the bird away, he discovers, to his amazement, a worn golf ball. The story is edifying, it deconstructs Singh's narrative of the local culture as a territory that has escaped all admixture with the external world. In other words, it is not pure and pristine as Singh's narratives claim. They are, they are hybrid territories and identities. Singh seems to deny that the islands have been subjected to official uh, ethnographic investigation at least twice before his own exploration of them. Martin Haberty published in 1859 a full-fledged ethnographic research work under the title The Airlines on the report of the excursion of the ethnographical section of the British Association from Dublin to the Western Islands of Erin in September 1857. Likewise, in 1892, a research investigation titled The Ethnography of the Airlines was submitted to the Royal Irish Academy. The studies reject the so-called and much uh, celebrated idea of racial purity by the revivalists. The inhabitants appear to be a mixed race in stark contrast to the idealization of the purity of West of Ireland, both racially and culturally. More ironically is the study of Aryan blood samples in 1956, which revealed not only striking differences with adjacent Galway and Clare, but unexpected similarities with industrial England suggested a mixing of Gaelic and English stock attributable to cross-breeding with occupying forces in the distant past. Likewise, Yeats's Galway is a phantasmagoric construction of a pure and prelapsarian national identity. Yeats's politicization of the West of Ireland tends to represent an idea of Irishness which is sanitized and aestheticized. Yet the history of the region is completely different from such a utopian poetics of it. A couple of generations before, Western Ireland had been exposed to the devastating effects of the Dillard hunger. More poignantly, the western coast of Ireland witnessed the mass immigration of Irish population to the United States and Canada. Aesthetic nationalism cults its rhetoric from phantasmal ideas of purity of race, geography, culture, and history. The history of the nation originates from time immemorial.